Dead America Gun Runners, Part 1 By Derek Slayton Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus Fifty Captain Kersey emerged from the dimly lit back office of the ammunition factory. Located on the western edge of Boise, the last couple of weeks had taken their toll on the captain, leaving him with barely any time to rest. The ongoing threat of undead mobs, several miles to their east in the heart of the Idaho capital, had diverted valuable resources, both in terms of manpower and weaponry, neither of which they had in abundance. Normally, that would have been enough to keep their limited force occupied, but another ominous threat loomed to the west. Wayne and his merry band of militia constantly hounded Kersey and his men as they tried to produce munitions. Despite their best efforts, Kersey and his men hadn't been able to get a sense of the militia's numbers or capabilities. While the militia hadn't mounted a full-scale assault against their position yet, Kersey knew it was only a matter of time before they did. As he surveyed the bustling activity in the factory, he knew that their relative skeleton crew of 60 would be hard-pressed to fend off such an assault, no matter how well defended their position was. After all, if the militia had managed to survive this long and support the former upper class of Boise, they undoubtedly had the manpower advantage. Captain Kersey's manpower issues were only going to worsen, as today was the day they had spent the last two weeks preparing for. Producing all of this ammunition wouldn't matter if they couldn't deliver it to the main force in Seattle, which was 500 miles away on a good day. It was likely much further than that, given the need to account for various threats like zombies and the militia. As he walked through the main area of the factory, the machines were working at half capacity, having burned through most of the raw materials they had brought in over the last couple of weeks. Retrieving more from other factories was on his to-do list but it was pretty far down the list of priorities. Morning, Cap, a voice called out, interrupting Kersey's thoughts. Captain Kersey looked past some of the machines to find Kowalski, the wise-cracking sniper, waving him over. Normally, he would have just nodded and kept moving, but Kowalski was holding a thermos along with some paper cups, so Kersey ventured over. Is that what I think it is, Kowalski? Kersey inquired. Piping hot liquid gold, yes, sir, Kowalski replied with a grin. You want me to pour you a cup? Kersey nodded, and the sniper gleefully poured them both a mug. I thought we ran out of coffee days ago. Where did this come from? Kersey asked. We had a visitor from Kuna this morning, Kowalski explained. Kersey's eyes widened, a tinge of fear running down his spine. The residents of the town of Kuna had aided them when they first arrived, but Kersey had negotiated their neutrality when he last spoke with Wayne. Damn it. They know they can't come here. If the militia sees them coming back and forth, then they'll be fair game. We don't have the resources to defend the factories, let alone adding a town full of civilians. Are they still here? Kersey questioned. Yep. I know they screwed up by coming here. So I put them in the back room with the gunrunner squad, Kowalski replied. Take me to them, Kersey ordered. Kersey marched through the factory, following behind Kowalski. It took them a moment to reach a small office area just off the loading docks. Inside were nine soldiers having some breakfast, and one lone civilian sitting by themselves in the corner. Cillian, the civilian, was perched on top of a counter, stretched out like he didn't have a care in the world. His late teen's defiance was punctuated by his long, dark hair. Kersey walked straight up to him, getting into his face and speaking forcefully. Do you have any idea what you've done? Kersey demanded. Cillian responded with a flippant tone. Yep, ran away from home to join the circus. Kersey's anger flared, and he raised his voice. You little shit. You just put everyone in Cuna in danger. Cillian gave a subtle shake of his head, his arrogance not breaking. Only if I go back, which I have no intention of doing. Kersey was taken aback by the statement, almost confused. Why would you leave the comfort and safety of that community? Because I want revenge, Cillian replied. Kersey's head dropped at the statement. You're too young for revenge, kid. 
Just go home and don't come here again. Kersey started to walk away from Cillian, who hopped up from seated position, raising his voice. Go home to what? My father and sister were both killed by the Chosen because they deemed them unworthy. I have nobody in Kuna, and I want to get back at the people who did it. Kersey again shook his head, trying to convince the young man that revenge wasn't the way. The Chosen are gone, kid. We took them down weeks ago. But you haven't taken down the militia who was backing them, have you? Cillian retorted. Kersey was a little confused, as he hadn't shared that bit of information with anybody other than his soldiers and the few leaders of Kuna. He tried to play it off. Not sure where you're getting your information, kid. But... Cillian interrupted Kersey. Heard it straight from the mouth of one of your own soldiers. Turns out when you slip them a bottle of vodka, their lips flap. And the name's Cillian, not Kid. Kersey grew more respectful, looking Cillian in the eyes and speaking calmly. Cillian, I know you're hurting from the loss of your family, but fighting against the militia is no joke. They're trained soldiers, and they're not going to show mercy on you just because you're young. We're trained soldiers, and even I'm not sure we can hold them off. Kowalski chimed in sarcastically. Wow, Cap, way to boost morale there. Kersey sighed. It's true, Kowalski, and you know it's true. We're outnumbered and outgunned, and having to worry about a teenager running around a battlefield wouldn't help things. Cillian spoke up again. Can I ask you something, Captain? Sure, Cillian, Kersey replied. We're what? Nearly two months into this apocalypse, Cillian began. That sounds about right, Kersey confirmed. And I'm still alive and kicking. Spent the first month of this being the sole source of supplies for my dad and sister, having to venture out and fight those things. I've lived on the battlefield. I know when to fight and when to run. And unlike most of your men, I know the region. I may not be able to win in a straight-up fight, but me and my dirt bike can certainly keep an eye on things for you. Don't dismiss me because of my age, because looking around this room, I'm not much younger than some of the people you're sharing a uniform with. Kersey stood there for a moment, unsure of what to do. He understood that his back was against the wall with the militia threat, but he also didn't want to put an untrained civilian into the thick of things, especially one who wasn't old enough to buy a drink at the bar. As he contemplated, a large Hispanic man got up from the group of soldiers. Sergeant Alvarez, in his early 30s, was an imposing physical specimen, and his voice carried the command of the room. Captain, a word, Sergeant Alvarez requested. Kersey nodded and walked over to the sergeant, who spoke in hushed tones. My team could use a scout, Sergeant Alvarez proposed. And you want a teenager doing that job? Kersey questioned. If he's survived this long, it's safe to assume he's capable. Plus, it solves two problems. It gives you an extra trained soldier who can stay behind, and it keeps your deal in place with the militia to keep Kuna out of the fight. Alvarez reasoned. Kersey wasn't completely sold, hesitating over the decision. Let me talk to him, Alvarez requested. He's all yours, Kersey agreed. Alvarez walked over to Cillian, who was dwarfed by the sergeant. I'm Sergeant Alvarez. My team and I are about to embark on a dangerous road trip up to Seattle. We're expecting resistance from zombies, but also expecting armed resistance from the militia, Alvarez explained. Cillian raised an eyebrow. Why would the militia care about your road trip? Because we're going to be carrying a million rounds of ammunition up to the military. Alvarez answered. Cillian smirked. I can see why that would make you popular. How can I help? You said you had a dirt bike. Are you any good with it? Alvarez inquired. Cillian replied confidently. Been competing in semi-pro events for the last few years. Wasn't winning, but I was competitive. And how good are you at dealing with those creatures out there? Alvarez pressed. Cillian considered the question. In a straight-up fight, I can handle one. Maybe two if I'm lucky. However, when it comes to moving through them, I'm quite good. 
I have a lot of tricks up my sleeve to get them moving where I want them to. So if we needed a mob moved off the highway so we could get through, Alvarez questioned. Then I'm your man, Cillian affirmed. One more thing. If you come out with us, you understand that I'm in charge. My word is the law, as far as you're concerned, Alvarez insisted. Cillian nodded without hesitation. If it means I'll get my chance to get back at the people who killed my family, I'm all for it. Alvarez turned around to Kersey, giving him an approving nod. Okay. Cillian, you're in. Sergeant, what do you need from me? Kersey asked. Just need to know when we'll be ready to hit the road, Alvarez inquired. Kersey looked over to Kowalski, hoping he had the answer. We're getting the last few cases packed up. Should be ready to go in an hour or so, Kowalski replied. Good. Captain, I believe I can take it from here. I know you have a lot to tend to, Alvarez stated. Appreciate that, Sergeant. If you need anything, Kowalski will get you taken care of, Kersey said. Alvarez nodded as Kersey and Kowalski left the room, leaving the newly formed team of ten to themselves. Cillian looked around at the group, everybody outside of Alvarez, appearing to be in their twenties. A mixture of black and white with one young, dark-haired woman amongst the group. Cillian gave a half-hearted, awkward wave to the group. And Private Acosta, the young woman, caught his eye. He quickly looked away when she looked back, a slight blush creeping onto his face. Sergeant Alvarez introduced the soldiers. That is Private Acosta. The rest of this motley crew is Corporal Fisher, Privates Henderson, Wallace, Robertson, Bradley, Leonard, and Hubbard. The soldiers weren't particularly interested in their newest recruit, giving him a half-hearted nod. Cillian finally spoke up. So, what's the plan? Alvarez motioned for him to follow over to a table that had some maps of the area. There was a path drawn leading up to Spokane that weaved through the wilderness. Cillian was confused. I thought we were going to Seattle, Cillian inquired. Too much militia activity on that path. We have a stronghold in Spokane, so if we deliver there, they'll take it the rest of the way, Alvarez explained. Cillian noted the problem right away. Smart, but it presents a problem right out of the gate. What's that? Alvarez asked. Horseshoe Bend, about 30 miles north of here. Cillian explained, It's just another small town, shouldn't be an issue, Alvarez replied. Cillian elaborated, There are two bridges over the river in the middle of downtown, and another just outside of town. Lots of bottleneck opportunities for those things to impede your route. Alvarez considered Cillian's input. Do you think you can clear them out? Cillian nodded confidently. Should be able to. What do you say? I go up and take care of it for you. Be a good way to show you what I can do. Sergeant Alvarez agreed. Okay, since you know the area so well, where do you want to rendezvous? Cillian thought for a moment. There's another small town called Cascade about 50 miles past that. It's open road between the two, but Cascade could be good to refuel. It's a lake town, and this time of year, it would be mostly empty, so resistance will hopefully be minimal. I'll scout it out and wait for you there. Alvarez nodded before going over to a table filled with gear. He grabbed a radio and tossed it to Cillian. We're on channel 12. Call when it's clear in Horseshoe Bend, Alvarez instructed. Cillian caught the radio and nodded excited to be a part of the action. Chapter 2 The dirt bike ride toward Horseshoe Bend proved to be a rare moment of relaxation for Cillian. It had been weeks since he had been able to let loose and ride freely, despite the crisp air and the biting breeze that swept across the snow-covered tundra. Cillian reveled in the sensation. Escaping the confines of the small community of Kuna was a welcome change. The people there had done their best to console him when he had shown up on their doorstep, fleeing from the Chosen. A pang of remorse for leaving them behind started to seep in. But Cillian shook it off when he spotted the sign for Horseshoe Bend. He brought his dirt bike to a stop on the road, gazing down the highway toward the first bridge leading into town, which lay half a mile away. The town's layout was unique. 
divided into two parts. After crossing the river, a small section of land hosted the school and six blocks of houses. Just beyond that was another bridge over the second part of the river, which wrapped around the town. On the other side lay the main section of town, with various neighborhoods and a modest downtown area. Normally, Horseshoe Bend was a quiet town, but that was far from the case now. Cillian dismounted and removed his backpack, opening it and rummaging through its contents. Besides the essentials like bottled water and granola bars, there was an eclectic mix of items. A dozen cell phones, ancient wind-up alarm clocks, a small collection of knives, and a crowbar. Cillian muttered to himself, Oh, come on. Where are you? After shifting some items around, he finally located a pair of binoculars. He couldn't help but chuckle at the memory of his grandmother giving them to him as a Christmas gift a couple of years earlier. Good old Gran, Cillian mused, wanting me to do something safe like bird watching instead of racing these things. Patting his dirt bike affectionately, he raised the binoculars to his eyes and focused on the bridge. Several cars were positioned nose to nose across the two lanes, a pitiful attempt at a barricade. Beyond the vehicles, trouble awaited in the form of 50 or 60 zombies. He suspected there were even more out of sight, but this was already a formidable challenge. The creatures were at the far end of the bridge, approximately 50 yards from the stalled vehicles. Cillian scratched his head and muttered to himself, Okay, Cillian, how are you pulling this off? He pondered for several moments before settling on a plan. He grabbed a cell phone from his bag, gauging its weight before returning it to its place. That'll never make it across, he concluded. Next, he retrieved one of the old-fashioned wind-up alarm clocks. He lifted it a few times, feeling the heft of its metal components. Now we're talking, Cillian remarked. He performed some rough calculations mentally and set a 10-minute timer on the clock. As soon as it was set, he revved his bike and sped toward the bridge. Stopping just 10 yards from the bridge's edge, he killed the engine. The sudden noise attracted the attention of the zombies on the other side, who began shuffling in his direction. With an air of nonchalance, Cillian strolled toward the parked cars. He walked up to the side of the bridge and hurled the alarm clock as hard as he could, sending it across the water to the other bank. It landed with a thud in the snow, cushioning its fall. Cillian then approached the first car retrieving the crowbar from his backpack. In one forceful motion, he shattered the driver's side window and repeated the act on the next car. As he returned the crowbar to his bag, he reached inside and shifted the car into neutral. Cillian began pushing while turning the steering wheel as far as it would go. It took a moment to build up momentum, but eventually, the car began to move. With a few pushes, he managed to roll it out of the way causing it to gently collide with the low concrete side of the bridge, just a couple of feet high. Turning his attention back to the approaching zombies, Cillian couldn't help but grin as he watched the lead zombie stumble on a patch of ice, crashing hard to the ground. Even though they were still about 25 yards away, he could distinctly hear the snap of arm bones. Been there, big fella. Broke my arm in two places during my third race. I got back up, and so can you. Cillian offered friendly advice to the zombie, chuckling to himself. His mood shifted back to seriousness as he pushed the car further out of the way. Moments later, he got it rolling quite smoothly. Just like the first one, it gently glided into the concrete barrier on the side of the bridge. Cillian turned his attention back to the zombies, who were now only 10 yards away and closing in fast. He glanced past them, spotting more emerging from the nearby neighborhood. It's been fun, but I really must be on my way, Cillian remarked. He jogged back to his bike, putting some distance between himself and the approaching ghouls. Starting the bike, he sped off down a side road to the west. Cillian pushed the throttle hard, savoring the long curve of the road as it followed the bend of the river. Half a mile up, he brought the bike to a stop and looked back toward the bridge through the scattering of trees along the road. Several zombies were still on the bridge, 
having lost interest in him when he disappeared from their sight. He waited for a few more moments, and then he heard the faint sound of an alarm clock. Right on time, Cillian murmured. He retrieved the binoculars and watched as the zombies on the bridge immediately turned and started shuffling toward the noise on the riverbank. The bridge's low barrier caused the zombies to topple over as they pursued the sound. One by one, they fell into the icy river below. Cillian knew it wouldn't clear the entire bridge, but it would suffice. He then shifted his focus to the neighborhood, observing a couple of dozen zombies drawn to the alarm clock's noise. A few of them slipped down the snow-covered embankment, disappearing from view. Alarm should go off for a good ten minutes or so. Probably won't get all of them, but should thin them out enough, Cillian concluded, satisfied with his improvised strategy. Cillian stashed away the binoculars and resumed his journey along the mostly deserted road, winding its way around the western outskirts of town, hugging the opposite bank of the river. The route provided a sense of tranquility despite the dire circumstances. However, his progress came to an abrupt halt as he reached the road's end, meeting the river's edge. Here, a shallow stretch of water exposed a patch of soil, offering a potential crossing point. On the other side, a half dozen zombies had congregated around a small camper, which had toppled onto its side. They were frantically pounding on it, clearly agitated by something hidden within. Cillian contemplated bypassing them, but the camper's proximity to the embankment he needed to ascend presented a potential problem. The noisy engine of his bike could easily draw their attention and lead to trouble. Instead, he steered his bike off the road to the right of the camper, carefully guiding it to a spot about ten yards short of the embankment. With a series of revs, he caught the notice of several zombies, and their excited moans lured others away from the camper, all converging on him. Cillian sat poised on his bike, reaching into his bag and retrieving a bottle of water. He took a leisurely sip as the encroaching creatures closed the gap. His amusement grew as the first zombies started sliding down the snowy embankment, tripping over a tree stump, flipping in midair, and tumbling into the icy water below. One down, Cillian noted with a wry grin. Over the next few moments, the remaining five zombies met similar fates, each one stumbling and tumbling into the water. Cillian remained seated, relishing his water, his expression tinged with smug satisfaction. After draining the bottle, he casually tossed it into his bag and rode his bike across the shallow waters, coming to a halt beside the fallen camper. Dismounting with crowbar in hand, he swiftly surveyed the overturned vehicle, finding no signs of movement. Yet, just as he was on the verge of letting his guard down, there was unexpected movement from inside. Hello? Anybody in there? Cillian called out and the movement within seemed to respond to his voice. He briefly contemplated opening the door, but dismissed the idea, choosing instead to approach the skylight, conveniently positioned just a few feet above the ground. He rapped on the roof before peering inside. A few seconds later, a zombie's face emerged on the other side. Cillian let out an involuntary scream, losing his balance and falling to the ground. After a moment of embarrassment, he scolded himself. It's a good thing nobody was around to hear that girlish scream. You're working with soldiers now. Man up. Gathering his resolve, he pushed himself back onto his feet, returning to the skylight to examine the trapped zombie. It appeared to be a young woman, not much younger than Cillian himself. Her vacant eyes and rapidly decaying skin presented a grim and unsettling sight. Cillian sighed with regret. I'm sorry that's how the story ends for you. Wish I could do something about it, but I can't. With that, he climbed back onto his bike, started the engine, and surveyed the road ahead. He continued his journey cautiously, avoiding the few remaining cars and straggling creatures that crossed his path. Cillian eventually came to a stop when he reached a point parallel to the town center, where the road rose slightly, affording him a view down into the streets below. Retrieving his binoculars, he scanned the area, 
only to be greeted by a confusing sight. What the hell happened there? He muttered as he observed an intersection near the heart of town. It was a complicated and perilous scene. A massive pileup obstructed the main road through town. Several cars lay on their sides and roofs. One of them appeared to be burned out. Surrounding the wreckage were hundreds of relentless zombies. Cillian grimaced, fully aware of the formidable challenge ahead. Looks like I'm really going to have to earn my keep today. Determined, he stashed away the binoculars, kicked his bike back into gear, and sped off toward the northern part of town, bracing himself for the trials that lay ahead. Chapter 3 Cillian rode his bike up to the northernmost part of town, the road he was on paralleling the final building before leaving, a steakhouse. To the side of that establishment stood an older home, complete with a small, detached garage. As he approached, his eyes caught sight of two zombies in the yard of the house, with a few more lingering 70 yards away outside the steakhouse. The gravity of the situation was not lost on him. Cillian took a moment to survey the scene and mentally listed everything he needed for his mission. He revved the engine of his bike, the roar echoing through the desolate streets, drawing the attention of the nearby creatures. Adrenaline pumping, he skidded the bike to a halt, leaping off it and deftly pulling a crowbar from his backpack. In one fluid motion, Cillian rushed towards the first zombie, swinging the crowbar with all his might. The weapon connected with a sickening crack, sending the ghoul tumbling to the ground. Without hesitation, he reversed the crowbar and drove its pointed end through the creature's head, ending its unholy existence. He didn't waste a moment, sprinting toward the other zombie outside the house. Leaping into the air, he led with his foot, knocking the creature backward into a tree. Cillian followed up by thrusting the crowbar into the creature's head, ensuring its demise. His attention then shifted to the approaching horde of zombies from the steakhouse. They were slowly advancing towards him, driven by an insatiable hunger for flesh. Cillian muttered to himself, Three minutes, in and out, a grim reminder of the time constraints that haunted his every move. He rushed over to the detached garage and forcefully lifted the heavy wooden door. Inside, he discovered an old-school workshop, a relic of a bygone era. Cillian scanned the cluttered space, searching for the items on his mental checklist. A full minute passed, and he couldn't find what he needed. Frustration gnawed at him. Oh, come on now. You gotta have something I need, he muttered. Finally, his eyes landed on a cardboard box on a shelf, adorned with various splotches of color. He reached for it and found several cans of spray paint. A sense of relief washed over him as he checked a couple of cans to ensure they were full before tossing them into his bag. He continued rummaging through the garage, eventually finding a half roll of duct tape, which he quickly pocketed. Although he had other items in mind, none were present, and the ominous moans and shuffling of feet from outside reminded him of the impending danger. You gotta move, man. You're out of time. Exiting the garage, he saw that the zombies were closing in, now just 15 yards from his bike. Without hesitation, he rushed to his motorcycle, hopped on and revved the engine, performing a wheelie as he sped back onto the road a few yards ahead. To the east, a gas station with toppled pumps and a wrecked car beyond it caught his eye. He knew he'd need a refill at some point, but for now, his focus remained on the immediate challenges. Cillian parked his bike in a vacant lot near a tree, removed the key, and pocketed it. He understood that the chances of encountering any survivors in the vicinity were slim, yet he took no chances when it came to protecting his bike. He began jogging towards the other side of town, approximately a mile and a half away, with two critical tasks on his mind. First, he needed to ensure the bridge was clear, and second, he had to find a safe passage for the caravan. Cillian muttered to himself, bridge first, then work your way back. He stuck to the western edge of town, staying close to the water, which provided a potential escape route, even if it meant facing the chilling waters of the river. After a few blocks, he confronted a neighborhood directly ahead, overrun with zombies. To his right, 
the river flowed while to his left, the downtown area posed its own set of challenges. Cillian chose to remain concealed along the riverbank, positioning himself behind a large tree. He retrieved his binoculars, studying the neighborhood's bleak panorama. The older houses were infested with the undead, dozens of them aimlessly roaming the streets. Cillian muttered under his breath, I guess that explains the pileup. Everybody trying to get out of Boise ended up here. He devised a plan through the neighborhood, pulling a cell phone from his bag, setting a timer for 10 minutes and lowering the volume halfway. He steeled himself for what lay ahead. Taking a deep breath, he advanced towards the nearest house, an old structure with windows that had seen decades of life. There were no zombies between him and the side of the house, but dozens loitered in the front and backyards, stretching down the block. Cillian clutched the phone in one hand and his knife in the other. He initiated the 10-minute countdown before sprinting towards the house. His footsteps were softened by the snow-covered grass, allowing him to get closer to the house without alerting the nearby creatures. A couple of zombies from the backyard started to shamble toward him, but he paid them no heed. Reaching the side of the house, he swiftly threw the phone as far as he could toward the riverbank, where it landed just before the decline started. Cillian's focus then shifted to the window. He inserted his knife into the narrow gap between the top and bottom panes, expertly manipulating it until the lock yielded. Finally, the window popped open and he leaped inside, landing with a thud on the floor. Taking a moment to catch his breath, Cillian carefully shut the window and slid to the side, hiding as a zombie wandered past outside. Within moments, he heard movement emanating from another room. He rose to his feet, brandishing his knife as two zombies. Both older adults stumbled into view in the front hallway. Their movements were sluggish, even for undead. Cillian prepared to strike, but noticed that the doorway they were entering closed towards the hallway, and there was another door leading into the room. Opting for the path of least resistance, he silently slipped out the other door, waiting patiently for the creatures to approach before gently tapping the door to keep their attention focused. Cillian then nonchalantly proceeded down the hall, making a right-hand turn towards the room. He peeked inside cautiously, witnessing the two ghouls pounding on the door he had just exited. As quietly as possible, he grasped the other door and pulled it shut, sealing the creatures within. Listening intently, Cillian heard nothing else from within the house. Well, I've got a few minutes, he mused to himself. Might as well check out the kitchen. Cillian ventured further into the kitchen, where a gruesome scene awaited him. Blood smeared across the floor, and he gingerly stepped around the pool of crimson, his mind filled with morbid curiosity. He quipped dryly, not sure who it was but one of you had a bad day when this all started. Opening the pantry door, he found little of value. A small collection of condensed soup and assorted dry goods. They were too heavy to carry and not worth the effort. However, just as he was about to shut the door, his eyes caught something precious, a large container of instant coffee. A grin of satisfaction crossed his face. Now, that is something worth the wait to carry. Cillian looked around the kitchen, grabbing a towel to wrap the coffee container in before stashing it in his backpack. As he did, a faint sound reached his ears, the distant alarm from the phone he had set off earlier. He headed towards the kitchen door, which led out to the side of the house in the direction of the bridge. From this vantage point, he had a clear view of the next street and the dozens of zombies scattered across yards. Gradually, they began to shuffle towards the source of the distracting alarm. Cillian mused. That's right, head on over there. You know you want that noise. He waited patiently for the ghouls to migrate, tracking their movement by the ongoing sound of the alarm. A few minutes passed, and the path to the next street was now clear. Cillian slipped out of the kitchen door, moving silently and cautiously, making sure not to make any noise as he advanced. Arriving at the next house, he glanced back at the mob he had attracted. It had grown significantly, 
Two dozen zombies were clustered around the blaring phone, their frustration palpable as they failed to reach the source of the noise. Some even tumbled over the embankment in their futile efforts, much to Cillian's bemusement. He shook his head at their lack of intelligence and continued his journey towards the bridge. The rest of the trip remained uneventful, with only a few scattered zombies that he easily avoided. Finally, Cillian arrived within sight of the bridge and could see movement on it. Realizing he needed a better vantage point, he spotted a two-story house on the corner just across from the bridge. He sprinted over to the house, encountering no zombies, and peered through the windows. The living room appeared empty. He inserted his knife into the window once more, expertly unlocking it, and slipped inside. Quickly regaining his footing, he listened for any signs of danger, but was relieved by the silence. Cillian mumbled to himself, finally picked a good one. He navigated through the house, found the stairs, and ascended to the second floor, searching for a window that overlooked the bridge. Upon entering a bedroom, he closed the door behind him for added security. As he approached the window, he took a knee and let out a sigh as he observed the grim situation outside. Similar to the bridge on the other side, this one also had a makeshift barricade formed by two cars lined up nose to nose. However, this bridge was overrun with zombies. To make matters worse, the tires on the cars were flat, rendering them immovable by him pushing alone. Adding to the difficulty were 40 creatures pressed against the cars. Cillian muttered, Well, not going to be able to push those out of the way. He racked his brain for a solution, while keeping his gaze on the horde of zombies. Not another bridge for them to cross, at least not one that isn't controlled by the militia. Come on, man. Think, how are you doing this? Cillian thought to himself. His eyes remained fixed on the bridge, and that's when he noticed one of the cars rocking back and forth under the weight of the zombie mob. They were presumably drawn by the alarm clock he had thrown earlier. Cillian's face lit up with an audacious idea. It's crazy, but if I can get enough of those things coming this way, I just might be able to have them do my job for me. He left the room and made his way to the other side of the house peering out towards the streets and yards he had traversed. In the distance, he spotted a few dozen zombies scattered about. Cillian tried his best to convince himself of the plan. Just have to be smart about it. And I can double those numbers on the bridge. This could work. Chapter 4 Cillian stood in the dimly lit backyard, his heart pounding as he contemplated the audacious plan he'd concocted. He felt a mixture of fear and determination coursing through his veins, battling for control of his thoughts. This is such a stupid idea, he muttered to himself, his voice trembling with uncertainty. He hesitated by the back door, unable to shake the doubts that plagued him. As he contemplated the risks involved, Cillian's mind raced with questions. Maybe they can just plow through the cars. The transports have to be fortified, right? It was a tempting idea, one that briefly crossed his mind. But he quickly dismissed it, shaking his head in self-doubt. But if you skip out on doing your job, they'll just cast you aside. Then what are you going to do? They're not going to carry dead weight to Seattle. You have to prove your worth. Cillian grappled with conflicting thoughts, searching for the resolve to move forward. Plus, what if they're in trouble? can't risk them getting into an accident while trying to break through. He nodded, convincing himself that the plan was indeed a necessity. With renewed determination, Cillian whispered to himself, Okay, you better open that door and go before you convince yourself not to. He finally pushed open the door, clutching his cell phone in one hand and a knife in the other, just in case. The door slammed shut behind him, drawing the attention he needed. Immediately, a couple of creatures to his left turned towards him and began shambling in his direction. He scanned his surroundings, realizing that for now, there was no imminent threat from any other direction. With a nonchalant shrug, he headed toward the approaching ghouls. Like last call at the bar, go towards anything giving you a look. 
Cillian mused as he strolled toward the two undead, his attention still on his cell phone. A pop song blared from the device, prompting him to shake his head in mild annoyance. Well, I better live through this because I'll be damned if this is the last song I hear. Unfazed by the approaching creatures, Cillian veered to his right, redirecting himself toward the initial group he had distracted. To his chagrin, the two ghouls he had initially bypassed had turned and were now following him. Oh yeah, wonderful idea, he muttered, still not entirely thrilled with his own decision. Nevertheless, he pressed on, knowing he had committed to the plan. As he continued walking, more stragglers joined the growing procession, following Cillian while moaning quietly. By the time he reached the initial group, there were 15 of them, all keeping pace with their newfound leader. However, the first group in the yard had dispersed somewhat due to the alarm on the throne cell phone stopping. They were now spread out, blocking any easy passage. Cillian's gaze shifted to his right, where he spotted numerous zombies in the neighboring house yards. They remained unaware of the earlier phone diversion. As soon as I head that way, I'm going to have them on me too. Just be ready for it, Cillian muttered to himself, continuing to verbalize his plan as he moves through town. As he approached the ghouls in front of him, they began to turn and shuffle toward him, drawn by his presence. He didn't manage to divert all of them, but he had gathered enough of their attention. With a sharp turn, he headed toward the road. Come on, work, work. Cillian urged himself and his plan, his voice tinged with desperation. The group that had been following him merged with the new arrivals, forming a horde of nearly 60. He increased his pace, putting a substantial distance between himself and the growing mob. He needed room to maneuver if things went south. The street stretched ahead, the bridge coming into sight, no more than a hundred yards away. Cillian glanced back, encouraged as he saw the pursuing horde. Too numerous to count. They were relentless now, actively chasing him. He pocketed the cell phone. Okay, easy part is finished. Now you have to pull this off, he whispered to himself, acknowledging the daunting challenge ahead. Cillian knew that if his plan was to succeed, he had to maintain the zombie's course preventing them from veering off or encountering the zombies on the bridge. He couldn't afford to falter. When he came within ten yards of the bridge, the chorus of moans behind him grew deafening, drawing the attention of some creatures on the bridge itself, their hollow eyes fixed on him. Now or never, go, Cillian shouted, his heart in his throat as he launched himself into action. Cillian's heart raced as he increased his pace sprinting toward the bridge. With every stride, he focused on his path, aiming for the relatively low concrete barriers at the edge. He hoped they would serve as a shield against the impending horde of zombies. Leaping up, he ran along the narrow barrier, teetering to maintain his balance. A fall into the icy waters below would be a terrible outcome, but falling toward the ravenous zombies would spell certain doom. Amidst the chaos, some of the zombies on the bridge turned to face the approaching mob, while a couple spotted Cillian and began pushing toward the edge. Fortunately, the ones targeting him were hemmed in by those who remained oblivious, unable to get past the others who weren't paying him any attention. Approaching a car barricade, Cillian felt a chilling touch as one zombie managed to graze his leg, causing him to stumble. He knew he was on the brink of toppling over so he pushed off with all his strength, aiming for the car's hood. His body collided with the undead heads pressed against the vehicle, and he landed hard on the hood, the momentum carrying him most of the way across. Instantly, the creatures at the front reached for him, their decaying fingers clawing at his clothing. Frantically, Cillian kicked and pulled himself away, landing with a thud on the other side of the car. The impact on the pavement knocked the wind from his lungs, causing him pain as he struggled to recover. Cillian rose to his feet, observing as the mob merged with the creatures on the bridge. Pushing them forward, the cars began to shake more violently, their flattened tires scraping against the pavement, 
creating a cacophonous sound. Cillian slowly backed away, positioning himself in the middle of the road to ensure the zombies continued pushing toward him. He pulled out his cell phone and restarted the blaring music. The entire horde lurched forward, causing cars to inch away under the mass's weight. He glanced over his shoulder, relieved to see only a few zombies approaching from behind, several hundred yards away. His gaze then fell upon a small house, 50 yards off the road. Cillian persisted with the auditory assault of dreadful pop music, luring the zombies closer. Finally, the dam broke, and the car slid aside as the mass behind them surged forward. Cillian turned and began walking back toward the house, cranking up the volume on the cell phone before tossing it down the street beyond the house. Quickly, he retrieved his knife, skillfully opening an old window and slipping inside. He drew the curtain shut and assessed the tiny three-room house, covered in a thick layer of dust, appearing untouched for a long time. The stale air and dust reassured him that he was alone inside. Cillian made his way to the bedroom, its window facing the road where he had tossed the phone. Gently peeling back the curtain, he observed the creatures congregating around the noise. That's right. Keep pawing at that while I catch my breath. Cillian muttered to himself. He winced as he grabbed his tender ribs, the result of his hard landing on the car. You've had worse falls on your bike, and you're a professional now. You better shake it off, he reminded himself. For several more minutes, Cillian kept a vigilant watch as the mob outside continued to grow. Then, he returned to the front, peering out the window he had entered. To his relief, the path on the bridge was clear, and his plan had succeeded. A wide opening on the bridge now awaited the convoy's passage. Just as he was about to leave, a realization hit him, and he smacked his forehead in frustration. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I have to pull those things away from the road so the convoy can get through, he scolded himself. Cillian dug through his bag, retrieved another cell phone, and set the timer for 20 minutes cranking the volume up to the maximum. Hopefully, this works, he muttered. He slipped out of the front door, walking away from the main road and through the deserted neighborhood. All the zombies in the vicinity had been drawn away by his actions. After a few blocks, he reached the water's edge, briefly admiring its beauty before snapping back to reality. Come on, you've got a job to do, he urged himself. Cillian activated the timer on the phone and set it down on a nearby rock, close to the river's embankment. He casually made his way back toward the bridge, keeping a safe distance from the ghouls along the riverbank. Finally, he had a view of the bridge, and he noticed that some of the creatures had lost interest in the previous cell phone and were now breaking away. Cillian glanced down at the river, seeing that it was relatively shallow. He sighed, realizing what he had to do. Wet shoes and wet pants on a freezing day. This is going to be loads of fun, he muttered. Sliding down the embankment, he braced himself for the cold as he stepped into the water. Almost instantly, his toes went numb as he waded through the water, which reached up to his waist. It took some effort, but he finally crossed to the other side, climbing up the embankment. It's a shrinkage factor of ten, he joked to himself as he tried to shake off the chill. He returned to the corner house, found some towels to dry himself off, and warmed himself up before searching for fresh socks. Isn't going to warm everything up, but it's a lot better than it was, he noted. Taking a few more minutes to regain warmth and feeling in his extremities, Cillian finally forced himself to get up and move. Okay, one problem down. Let's see about that roadblock he said determinedly as he prepared to continue his mission. Chapter 5 Cillian, now warmed up with the change of socks, stood by the door to the house, his gaze fixed on the distant downtown area a few blocks away. Thanks to his crafty handiwork, there were no zombies within his immediate view, but he remained acutely aware that the center of town was a different story. As he rummaged through his bag to check his inventory of alarms, his eyes wandered to a table off to the side, 
where an old wind-up alarm clock rested. Its continued functionality impressed him. God, I love these old houses, he muttered to himself, tossing the clock into his bag before slinging it onto his back and stepping outside. He began to walk through the yard, choosing the snow-covered grass to muffle his footsteps. After the past hour of tension, he decided to savor this fleeting moment of calm. Approaching within a couple of blocks of downtown, the chaos of the pileup gradually came into focus. Cillian leaned against a tree, retrieving his binoculars to assess the situation. The road was a complete mess. It appeared that someone had run a red light, colliding with a truck and flipping it over. More vehicles had joined the carnage, forming an impassable maze of twisted metal. Yet, it wasn't just the pileup that concerned him. It was what lay beyond it. Though he couldn't see through to the next intersection, he detected significant movement. Dozens of zombies meandering about. Despite the road being blocked to traffic, there were still openings large enough for the creatures to slip through if provoked. Cillian knew he had to tread carefully. Let's check out the next block over. See what we can see, he mumbled, pocketing the binoculars and making his way across the street, weaving through people's yards. As he rounded the corner of a house, his heart leaped when decrepit arms reached out for him. Fortunately, a tall fence separated him from the zombie, which thrashed against the barrier, letting out frustrated moans. Cillian swiftly drew his crowbar and swung it, shattering the creature's skull. Maybe next time, take a few steps away from the house, you dumbass, he scolded himself, tapping his head as a reminder of the close call. If not for the fence, he could have become zombie chow. Shaking off the near-death experience, he continued through the yard, keeping a safe distance from the next house before emerging behind it. Cillian proceeded toward the street, his head swiveling as he scanned for movement. Ghouls roamed harmlessly a couple of blocks to his right, but to his left, there was a straight shot along the backside of downtown and around the wreckage. The issue lay with the couple dozen or so creatures in the road, aimlessly hoping for prey. Cillian crossed the street and, once again, pulled out his binoculars. He surveyed the row of buildings on the opposite side of the street, a solid block with no alleyways. At least I don't have to worry about those things coming from the next street. Just need to figure out something to do with this group, he mused. Positioning himself in the middle of the street to get a clear view of the buildings on the opposite side, he noticed only a couple of buildings, not the continuous row found on the downtown side. The corner buildings didn't catch his attention, but the one in the middle seemed suitable. It was an old mechanic's garage, a fixture in the area for generations. He nodded to himself and moved one block closer before turning toward the back of the building. The path was mostly clear with only a couple of creatures near the building on the closest corner. Cillian held his crowbar ready, stealthily navigating through the snow. He approached the first creature and swung hard, the skull cracking as the zombie crumpled to the ground. The sound of impact drew the other zombie's attention. It groaned and staggered toward Cillian, who prepared for another strike. The task was made easier as the zombie slipped on the snow, falling right at Cillian's feet. Not one to squander an opportunity, he jammed the crowbar into the back of its head, ending it swiftly. Cillian paused at the side of the building, peering through a gap about ten yards wide. A few zombies on the street had been intrigued by the earlier noise, knowing that their approach would complicate matters. Cillian quickly fashioned a snowball, adding a touch of ice for weight. Stepping away from the building, he hurled it with all his might towards the road on the other side. A few seconds later, he heard it hit the ground near the zombies. Though not a deafening sound, the crunch of ice on pavement proved sufficient to divert their attention. Peeking around the corner, Cillian saw the approaching zombies were no longer interested. He gave them a moment to return to the street before swiftly crossing the open expanse. Arriving at the back of the building, he tried the back door, only to find it locked. Glancing upward, he spotted windows above ground level and jumped up to peer inside. The garage appeared empty, 
devoid of cars and with tools scattered about. Relieved to find the window unlocked, Cillian carefully maneuvered through it. It took him a moment to position himself safely on the ground inside, ensuring he wouldn't break his neck during the entrance. Once on the ground, he quickly surveyed the bays to confirm he was alone. Satisfied, he approached the back door, which had a simple deadbolt. Flicking it open, he pushed the door to test its security. It opened without a hitch. Okay, this should be a walk in the park, Cillian murmured, preparing to enact his trap. Cillian tried to convince himself that this was the best plan he could come up with, but doubt lingered at the fringes of his mind. Nonetheless, he pressed on, moving toward the bay doors and peering outside. Right by one of the doors were half a dozen zombies, uncomfortably close. Not willing to take the risk, he shifted to the other door for a better view. The zombies were still nearby, but not right outside. Here we go, Cillian murmured. He took a few moments to steady himself, then reached down and firmly grasped the handle of the bay door. In one swift motion, he yanked it upward, stopping it just above his head, creating an opening just large enough for him to slip under. He couldn't help but add a touch of theatricality to the situation. Come one, come all. We are officially open for business, he declared. The zombies outside responded with an excited chorus of moans, staggering toward him. Cillian continued to back up, creating noise to lure as many of them inside as possible. Hey now, you don't want to be left out in the cold. Come on in, he taunted. Cillian swiftly moved to the back door, cracking it open as the zombies filed into the building, their moans echoing against the concrete walls. When the lead ghoul was just a few yards away, he slipped out the door, slamming it shut behind him. He moved toward the side of the building, crowbar in hand, and peered around the corner. The creatures he had distracted with a snowball wandered past the gap between the buildings, drawn toward the open bay door. When they were out of sight, Cillian cautiously approached the corner. He reached the corner of the building, glancing around the side as the last group of ghouls on the street shuffled into the building, attracted by the noise of their companions. After allowing them a few seconds to enter, Cillian emerged from hiding. He edged closer to the bay door, stepping slightly away from the building to avoid any surprises. To his relief, all the zombies had gathered at the back, pressing against each other. Closing time, he muttered. Cillian reached up and pulled the bay door down as hard as he could, securing it in place. He peered inside through the window as a few zombies turned and stumbled toward him, their teeth gnashing against the glass in futile frustration. That went a lot better than I thought it would, Cillian noted with a satisfied smirk. He gave the trapped ghouls a playful wave before turning toward the road and quickly making his way to the next block. He checked the intersection leading to the main road, ensuring it was clear. Taking an extra precaution, he moved up another block before cutting over and scanning both directions on the main road. While there were dozens, if not hundreds of zombies near the pileup, only a small handful were scattered along the road leading out of town. Cillian nodded to himself, confirming that the route was clear. He reached into his bag and retrieved the spray paint. One quick message, and we're on to the next town, he said to himself. Cillian retraced his steps back to the garage, playfully waving to the trapped zombies as he passed by. He then approached the roadblock, pausing just before it. There was a small opening between a car and the building, with zombies on the other side. He waited until the nearest creature was looking away before silently crossing. With a few swift and quiet steps, he cleared the gap, holding his breath, hoping he hadn't been noticed. Fortunately, the zombie remained oblivious. Cillian reached the center of the wreckage, spotting a sedan on its side, its roof pointing straight down the main road. Using the spray paint, he drew a big arrow pointing to the right and added the words, Hey, Sarge, one block over, then up and back. For a touch of flair, he included a smiley face before stepping back to admire his handiwork. Okay, let's double back a block and get up to the bike, 
still have a lot of ground to cover before the day is over, he concluded. As he walked back to his bike, he pulled out the radio and switched it to channel 12. Sergeant Alvarez, come in, Cillian radioed. Sergeant Alvarez responded, You done already, Cillian? Yes, sir, Cillian confirmed. You have a path straight through town and directions to boot. Good job. Sergeant Alvarez praised. We're running behind schedule, but should be out shortly and headed your way. Copy that, Sergeant. I'm on the move to the next stop, Cillian acknowledged. Be safe, and we'll be in touch, Sergeant Alvarez concluded. Cillian pocketed the radio before turning his gaze to the north. Let's get back to the bike and on the road. Long way to go before the day is out. Chapter 6 Cillian kicked the side stand up, his gloved hand gripping the motorcycle's handlebars. The engine roared to life, a deep growl that echoed through the empty streets. He gave it a moment to warm up, his eyes flicking to the map laid out in front of him on the bike's tank. Cascade was circled on it, a destination about 50 miles to the north, and there weren't many stops along the way. The wind brushed against his leather-clad form as he adjusted his grip on the handlebars, his gloved fingers flexing. Open road for the next hour. Should be nice, Cillian mused, his voice tinged with a hint of excitement. With a sudden twist of his wrist, he hit the throttle, and the bike's front wheel lifted off the ground for a brief moment, tempting fate. Quickly, he eased it back down onto the pavement, a cautious grin tugging at his lips. He accelerated, knowing he needed to make good time, but not wanting to risk an accident. The ride was a picturesque one. Snow-covered trees occasionally giving way to reveal the glistening river beyond. Cillian couldn't resist slowing down to savor the view, a rare moment of serenity, in a world now overrun by the walking dead. As much as he longed to kick back for an hour and enjoy the scenery, the reality of his situation pushed him forward. He picked up the pace, the road unwinding before him as he rolled towards Cascade. The small town nestled by the waterfront of Lake Cascade came into view, separated from the mainland by the river, surrounded by water on all sides. It had once been a haven for vacationers, but Cillian was less thrilled about the prospects now. Two more bridges to deal with, and have to hope for some gas too, he muttered to himself, the tension in his shoulders growing palpable. After nearly an hour of riding, Cillian spotted a weathered sign by the roadside, proudly proclaiming Cascade, two miles. He slowed down, knowing that the likelihood of encountering the infected was now higher. He continued cautiously through the next couple of miles, a lack of civilization evident before the bridge that led into town. All it would take was one unfortunate accident, much like what he'd seen in Horseshoe Bend. Minutes passed without any sign of the undead, and Cillian finally reached a vantage point where he could see the bridge up ahead. He stopped and pulled out his binoculars, peering through them with a sense of foreboding. Hundreds of zombies littered the bridge, a makeshift barricade reduced to shambles. It was clear that the town's residents had tried to defend their sanctuary, perhaps without realizing that some of their own had been turned. Cillian noticed that the breaches in the barricade weren't from the outside trying to get in. It was the residents desperately attempting to escape. Abandoned cars with mangled front ends lined the road on his side of the bridge, evidence of frantic attempts to break through. His gaze settled on one car, a bloody driver slumped behind the wheel head resting at an unnatural angle. Well, this isn't going to work. If they took the time to block this bridge, it's safe to assume they did the same on the other side. And this town is far too big for me to clear out alone. Cillian muttered, his voice heavy with resignation. He glanced at his map, tracing his finger along small side roads that circumvented the town, though it required some backtracking. Better get to it, he decided turning his bike around and retracing his path for a mile before finding the turnoff road. A small house stood a few hundred yards ahead, a car parked in front of it. Cillian approached cautiously, his senses on high alert. He hoped that the homeowner wasn't present. 
As he drew nearer, he saw that the front bay window was smeared with blood, curtains lying in disarray. Using his crowbar, he shattered the driver's side window, pushing the car into neutral and rolling it out onto the street. He left a spray-painted message on the car's side. Take the next right, follow blue arrows on the ground. It read, accompanied by one of his trademark smiley faces. The next 30 minutes were spent navigating the back roads with caution, knowing danger lurked around every bend. At each intersection, he consulted his map, marking the pavement with bright blue paint to guide any potential convoy in the correct direction. Finally, he reached the last turn, leading back to the main road. He put the arrow down and prepared to restart his bike. However, just before he could do so, a faint sound reached his ears. A soft whirring, like spinning fan blades. Cillian looked up, spotting something dark descending rapidly behind the trees a few hundred yards away. The noise ceased as quickly as it began, leaving him uncertain. Get moving, man. Get moving, he urged himself, forcing his hand to twist the throttle. He accelerated, heading back towards the main road, determined to test a theory. As he rounded a bend, the bridge came into view, and normally, he'd stop to inspect it for anything useful. But right now, he had something else in mind. He pushed the throttle to the limit, reaching unsafe speeds. With a red can in hand, he sprayed a long line across the center line as he weaved back and forth, creating an unusual mark. Cillian returned the can to his bag and glanced over his shoulder. In the distance, he spotted a pickup truck speeding towards him. Shit, I'm not alone. The truck behind him gained speed rapidly, closing the distance between Cillian and his pursuers. Panic threatened to overwhelm him as he realized he couldn't simply outrun them. He needed a plan and quickly. The chase continued for several more miles, the truck maintaining its relentless pursuit even as Cillian attempted evasive maneuvers. His eyes scanned the horizon, and relief washed over him as he spotted a small town up ahead. A sign on the right announced, Donnelly, just outside the main downtown area, to the side of the sign, a narrow trail led into the woods. Thinking on his feet, Cillian swung his bike to the far left-hand side of the road, the truck hot on his tail. He steadied himself, knowing he had only one shot at this. With a sudden move, Cillian cut sharply across the road just before reaching the sign, switching to the right lane. The truck, a moment behind in reaction time, struggled to adjust its course. This delay bought him just enough time to slam on his brakes, allowing the truck to speed past him. Quickly, Cillian adjusted his course, heading into the woods down the trail. It was a rough and bumpy ride, but he managed to navigate it with skill. He rode for the better part of a mile before finally coming to a stop. Think, man. Think. You can't outrun them. You've got to do something, Cillian muttered to himself, the distant roar of the truck's engine growing louder. He glanced around, spotting a fallen tree on the ground, its limbs still substantial. Cillian pushed his bike off the trail and laid it down on the other side of the tree, using the brush as cover. His crowbar was in hand, secured on his back. Cautiously, he moved through the woods towards the sound of the approaching truck, which abruptly cut off. Peering through the trees towards the road, Cillian spotted two heavily armed men disembarking from the truck and scanning his direction. Damn it, he hissed under his breath. Desperation gnawed at him, and he devised a risky plan. If I can lure them into town, Get a few of those things to occupy their attention. I can circle back and slash the tires, he mumbled to himself. But he knew it was a terrible plan, given the vast difference in firepower and training between him and the two armed men. Cillian continued to move, trying to stay parallel with the town. However, a stumble over underbrush sent him tumbling to the ground, breaking branches and creating a racket that alerted his pursuers. A split second later, gunshots pierced the quiet woods, bullets impacting the trees dangerously close to him. Panic surged through him as he scrambled to his feet, determined to put distance between him and the armed men. 
Holy shit! He exclaimed, his heart pounding in his chest. Bullets whizzed past him, some grazing him as he sprinted through the woods. Finally, he spotted a small neighborhood to his left, the trees giving way to an open area. He had no other choice but to make a dash for it. Hopefully, it's crowded. Cillian hoped, but his optimism quickly deflated as he emerged from the trees. There were only a few small houses, devoid of any signs of life. No zombies, no people. Just an empty expanse. That figures, he muttered. Another gunshot echoed from behind, spurring him into action. He darted across a yard, reaching the back door of a house. Using his crowbar, he smashed through the glass and rushed inside. Instead of hiding, Cillian sprinted through the house, flinging open the front door and making several steps into the yard when he abruptly halted. He glanced down the street, the downtown area a couple of blocks away, but with wide open space between him and his destination. Doubt crept in as he considered whether he could make it there safely. Cillian's gaze shifted back to the house, where he noticed a small wooden door at the corner leading to the crawl space underneath. This is a bad idea, he mumbled to himself. Regardless of his reservations, he forced himself to retrace his steps carefully through the snow. He reached the front of the house using a brick barrier to separate the yard from the flower patch. He walked along the bricks to avoid leaving new tracks and quickly grabbed the wooden door, pulling it open. He climbed underneath the house, closing the door behind him. The sound of footsteps reverberated from above, and Cillian held his breath, remaining as still as possible. Tense moments passed as the two men rushed through the house, clearing it. Eventually, they emerged from the front, following the footsteps to the road, scanning the town center. Cillian's heart raced as he silently pleaded for them to head in that direction. He watched through a small crack between the door and the house as they debated their next move. His relief was palpable when one of them gestured for the other to follow. They moved towards downtown. Cillian let out a long, shuddering sigh of relief, but remained firmly in his concealed position. Five minutes and you're out the door, he told himself. He lay there, trembling with a mix of cold and fear, hoping that his makeshift plan continued to work, even as he questioned the odds stacked against him. Chapter 7 Cillian understood the stakes all too well. The longer he remained concealed, the greater the risk that his pursuers would track him down. The thought lingered in his mind, an ominous reminder of his vulnerability. Get moving, man, Cillian urged, the urgency apparent in his voice. You saw them head towards downtown. This is your chance to double back to the car. After a moment of internal struggle, Cillian finally convinced himself to act. He approached the door with caution, bracing for the worst. As he gingerly pushed it open, relief washed over him when he found the yard devoid of any immediate threats. Cillian rose to his feet, his senses on high alert as he surveyed his surroundings, seeking any signs of danger. He moved with a deliberate swiftness, silently making his way back to the front door and slipping inside without hesitation. Pausing at the back door, he stayed hidden, scanning the area for any potential assailants. His heart raced, but his relief mounted as he failed to spot any immediate threats. With quick, purposeful strides, he crossed the yard, his movements fluid as he headed towards the road that led back to the woods. However, before he could round the next house, the sharp crack of a gunshot pierced the air, narrowly missing him. The bullet struck the house's side, sending brick fragments flying into Cillian's face, causing him to instinctively retreat. The subsequent burst of gunfire peppered the house with bullets. Damn it. They must have thought I'd double back, Cillian muttered under his breath, his determination unbroken. He quickly retraced his steps, darting towards downtown, navigating through the yards to stay ahead of his pursuer. As he turned towards downtown, only two blocks away, a barrage of shots rang out when he crossed an open area between two houses. He felt the whizzing bullets pass by him, 
a terrifying sensation that spurred him to move even faster. He continued his sprint, opting for the pavement to gain better traction, abandoning any concern about leaving footprints. He closed in on the small downtown area, a two-by-two two block radius of solid rows of buildings, each housing multiple businesses. Cillian made a sharp right onto Main Street, following the center of town, just as one of his pursuers fired another shot. The bullet grazed him, ripping his clothing and burning his skin, prompting a startled yelp. His immediate fear subsided when he realized it was a superficial wound, barely bleeding. Cillian couldn't afford to slow down, running up the street as he searched for a place to hide. His confusion grew as he found no signs of violence in town. No bodies littering the streets, no wrecked cars, not even any cars at all. The only indication of something amiss was the shattered front glass door of a hardware store, its large pane partially intact, jagged and menacing. With limited options, Cillian approached the door, nearly reaching for the knob, before spotting a thin line leading from the handle inside, disappearing into the ceiling. He followed it with his eyes and realized it was a booby trap, albeit rudimentary, with sharpened metal affixed to the front part of a lawnmower. Cautiously, he stepped over the broken glass, entering the store while meticulously avoiding triggering the trap. Easy now, easy. Cillian whispered to himself, his heart still racing. Before disappearing further into the store, he considered his next move. He decided to kick the top part of the shattered glass, sending shards out into the street in hopes of attracting attention. Inside the darkened store, Cillian scanned for cover and an escape route in case the front door trap failed him. He located the back shop counter, leading to the storeroom and positioned himself behind it, ready to access the storeroom if necessary. Peeking over the counter, he watched as one of his pursuers approached, assuming the other wasn't far behind. Come on, take the bait, Cillian muttered under his breath, his heart pounding in his chest. The armed man noticed the broken glass and swiftly turned his attention to the interior of the store. Cillian left his head just high enough for the gunman to see, but low enough to duck down safely. The gunman raised his weapon and fired a shot at Cillian, narrowly missing him. He then kicked in the door and rushed inside, unwilling to risk injury from the glass. As the door opened, the tripwire released, and the makeshift device slammed into the unsuspecting man. Cillian winced as he witnessed the pointed metal piercing straight through the man's torso. The impact left the assailant unable to scream, his lungs already filling with blood resulting in a sickening, gurgling sound. Cillian remained still for several moments, ensuring that the man was indeed dead. Finally, he cautiously emerged from cover, his eyes fixed on a much-needed prize, the assault rifle lying on the ground. Just run up and get it, Cillian urged himself, adrenaline coursing through his veins as he contemplated his next move. Cillian's mantra, just run up and get it, echoed in his mind as he edged closer to the weapon lying just a few yards away. However, his focus abruptly shifted when he caught movement out of the corner of his eye. His full attention turned to the front window of the store, where the other gunman approached, his weapon raised but slightly lowered upon seeing his comrade hanging by the booby trap, bleeding out. The second gunman turned his head, peering through the window, locking eyes with Cillian, who was crouched low in the aisleway, concealed but not entirely hidden. A tense standoff ensued, neither man daring to make the first move. Suddenly, the gunman aimed his weapon towards the interior of the store, and Cillian knew he had to act. He lunged to the side, hitting the ground hard behind a metal shelving unit. Gunshots erupted, bullets ricocheting off the shelves and merchandise. Cillian moved as quickly as he could, crawling on his stomach, staying low, determined to put distance between himself and the deadly hail of bullets. He reached the far end of the aisle, just as the gunfire ceased, then got up and sprinted toward the storeroom, the sound of shattering glass marking the gunman's entry. Cillian reached the storeroom, 
bolting through the door just as the second gunman closed in from behind. Bullets whizzed past, narrowly missing him as he escaped. He raced down the backs of the stores, turning a hard left at the corner just in time to avoid a clear shot from the gunman, who was relentless in his pursuit. Panicked and desperate for a safe haven, Cillian cast a wary glance back towards the store he had just fled. There lay the weapon he so desperately needed. It was entirely possible that the gunman had grabbed it on his way in, but Cillian clung to the hope that it had been overlooked in the heat of the chase. However, another problem nagged at him. The possibility that the gunman was expecting him to return for the weapon. Despite multiple opportunities, Cillian hadn't fired a single shot in their direction, suggesting he was unarmed. Fear coursed through his veins, but he knew he had no choice. He needed that weapon to level the playing field. Casting aside his doubts, Cillian decided to make a dash back to the store, relieved that he wasn't instantly killed upon re-entering. As he approached the doorway, another shot rang out, narrowly missing his head and deflecting harmlessly off the wall. Cillian leaped forward, crashing onto the ground and scrambling over the broken glass toward the assault rifle lying on the floor. He fumbled with it, struggling to gain control as the gunman's footsteps neared the front door. You need to stop moving, the gunman commanded, his voice dripping with menace. Cillian rolled onto his back, raising his hands in surrender, his eyes locked with the gaze of the middle-aged man. The man bore the marks of a life filled with hardship scars etched into his arms, the result of some past explosion or conflict. Why are you doing this? What did I ever do to you? Cillian asked, his voice trembling. It's nothing personal, kid, the gunman replied, his demeanor cold and unwavering. You're just caught up in a bad situation. If it were up to me, you'd just tell me what you know and be on your way. But it's not up to me. Plus, you killed my buddy here and I can't in good conscience let that go. Cillian desperately tried to explain. I'm just out for a ride, man. Want to find someplace quiet to hang out until spring. The gunman remained unswayed, his suspicion evident. If that were true, then you wouldn't be leaving signs all over the place. They're moving the bullets, aren't they? Cillian shrugged, feigning nonchalance. Believe whatever you want, man. I'm just out for a ride. The gunman retrieved a satellite phone and made a brief call. Never breaking eye contact with Cillian. C-team checking in. They're going the northern route. My guess is soon because their scout is already north of Cascade. Copy that. After pocketing the phone, the gunman aimed the rifle at Cillian, who was consumed by fear. Again, nothing personal, kid. Before the gunman could pull the trigger, an authoritative, booming voice resonated from the sidewalk. You need to stop firing that rifle, the voice commanded. The gunman was taken aback. Oh yeah, why's that? The voice belonged to a giant of a man, well over six feet tall, muscular, with a flowing beard and an axe by his side. Well, besides the fact I asked nicely, the giant replied. It's because there are zombies spread out all over these woods. I'd rather not have them back in my town. The gunman glanced at the stranger with skepticism. Your town, huh? Guess I missed the memo. Guess you did, the giant retorted, approaching the gunman, his grip firm on the axe. Now, please, lower your weapon and move along. The gunman hesitated, then made a sudden move, aiming the rifle at the imposing figure beside him. In a swift and calculated response, the giant flung his axe blade upward, slicing deep into the gunman's arm. The man screamed in agony as blood spurted from the wound. Seizing the opportunity, Cillian scrambled for the rifle, firing a single round into the man's torso. He collapsed to the ground in a gurgling, bloody heap. The giant retrieved his axe from the dying man's arm before turning his attention to Cillian. Not sure if you heard me earlier, but if you could stop firing, that would be great, the man said. Cillian lets go of the rifle, raising his hands. I'm done, sir. I'm done. Now who are you? 
And why are you in my town causing a ruckus? The man said, tone serious. I'm just a scout, sir, trying to help some friends of mine move some goods up to Seattle. Seattle, huh? Your friends wouldn't happen to be military, now would they? The man asked. Cillian hesitated before answering, knowing that the military isn't popular in this region. They are, sir. But it's just a means to an end. I'm just trying to get to Seattle. The giant studied Cillian for a moment before motioning for him to get up. Well, come on then. Looks like you've had a rough day. Why don't you come to my place and we'll get you some food? Cillian nodded, leaving the rifle on the ground as he got up, not wanting to provoke the man further. I... I didn't get your name, sir. I'm Cillian, he said. You can call me Big Chief, Giant replied with a reassuring smile. Chapter 8 Big Chief led Cillian through the dense woods, the dirt bike clunking along the rugged trail. Their journey had taken them deep into the wilderness a silence between them that lingered for nearly 20 minutes. Cillian couldn't quite fathom the man's intentions, but he felt somewhat trapped in this peculiar situation. At last, they emerged from the woods into a clearing, and a small sign welcomed them to Roseberry. The town was incredibly modest, comprising just five structures, one of which emitted smoke from its chimney. Most of the buildings appeared to be houses, except for a diminutive post office. Welcome to my home, Cillian, Big Chief announced. Cillian surveyed the surroundings, his eyes catching sight of a substantial fence surrounding the property, reinforced with multiple layers, barbed wire, and menacing metal stakes protruding from it. Big Chief guided him to a gate, which he promptly unlocked ushering them inside and securing it behind them. How are you doing on fuel for that thing? Big Chief inquired. Honestly, I'm getting lower than I would like, Cillian replied. Big Chief nodded knowingly. Roll it over to that first building there. I got you covered. Cillian followed his instructions, and Big Chief opened the door, rummaging inside for a moment before emerging with a gas can. He affixed a nozzle to it and handed it over. I'll let you do the honors. I know some men can be touchy with their bikes. I know because I'm one of them, Big Chief said, a hint of amusement in his voice. Cillian chuckled as he began pouring the gas. I really appreciate you doing what you did for me back there. Big Chief shrugged modestly. I didn't really do anything except ask him to stop firing off his gun, but you're welcome nonetheless. Still, it is appreciated. Cillian responded. The conversation shifted and Big Chief spoke. So, are you coming from Boise? Yes, I am, Cillian confirmed. Big Chief raised an eyebrow. Don't think I've met too many people in my life from Boise who were anxious enough to get to Seattle that they'd venture out into a zombie apocalypse. I'm guessing there's a long story there. Cillian's tone grew somber. Not that long, really. There's a war brewing in Boise between two groups I'm not a part of. Even so, my father and sister became collateral damage a couple of weeks ago, and I don't intend on sticking around, so it can happen to me. Big Chief offered a sympathetic nod. My apologies, I didn't mean to stir up bad memories. Cillian sighed, reflecting on the harsh reality they all faced. It's okay. I doubt there's a man left alive who hasn't experienced loss. Still, nothing but happy talk from here on out. Deal, Big Chief said. Deal, Cillian agreed. As Cillian looked around at the small town, he expressed his admiration. You have quite the setup here. You manage this all yourself. Just me and my better half, Big Chief replied with a hint of warmth. Cillian hesitated for a moment, unsure if he should press further, but Big Chief sensed his unease and broke into laughter. Dispelling the tension, he playfully smacked Cillian on the back. Don't worry, she's still with us. Judging by the level of smoke coming from the chimney there, I'm guessing she has dinner just about ready. With his dirt bike now fueled up, Cillian returned the gas can to Big Chief, who stashed it inside the building. Big Chief 
then led Cillian over to the house, knocking on the door. Honey, I'm home, and I have company, Big Chief announced as he opened the door. Jody, a beautiful woman, stood by the fireplace, tending to a couple of cast iron pans sizzling above the flames. Her radiant smile illuminated the room. Bringing home strays, are we? She quipped. Big Chief chuckled. Sorry, hun. Felt obligated because he saved me from an impolite guest. Jody's concern briefly surfaced before she joined in the laughter. Since this one can't seem to do introductions, I'm Jody, his wife. I'm Cillian. I can't thank you enough for letting me into your home. It's been a long day, out in the cold. Cillian expressed his gratitude. Well, come on over here and get warm by the fire, Jody kindly invited. Cillian followed her instructions, kneeling by the fire, nearly tempted to warm his hands directly in the flames. Jody glanced at Big Chief with a hint of amusement in her voice. You know you can't keep him, right? She teased. Big Chief grinned mischievously. What if I promise to feed him every day? Jody couldn't help but laugh as she shook her head and returned to her culinary duties. Go ahead and get the table set up because we're ready here. Big Chief efficiently set the table, and soon they were all gathered round it. Jody served up a piping hot casserole with a side of sauce. I do hope this is okay, Cillian. If I had known we were having guests, I would have broken out the steaks, Jody remarked. Cillian examined the casserole, which boasted bacon and hearty chunks of meat. His eyes widened with excitement. This is wonderful, Jody. I don't think I've had a meal this good since all this began. Well, you eat up because we have plenty, Jody assured him. Big Chief chimed in with a grin, and if we ask nicely, we might just be able to convince Jody to make us some cobbler. Cillian's eyes lit up at the thought, and Jody nodded subtly, giving her approval. Big Chief looked positively thrilled. Jody added a final condition, but our guest picks the filling. We have apple, cherry, and peach. Cillian exchanged a quick, subtle glance with Big Chief, who mouthed apple to him. Cillian responded with a discreet thumbs up, prompting a bright smile from Big Chief. So if you don't mind me asking, how did you two find yourselves here? Cillian inquired. Jody motioned to Big Chief, who began to explain their story. Well, Jody and I always wanted a quiet little life together. We're both from small towns, and we both wanted to get back to it. We were actually house shopping in Cascade. The day all of this started, just got out of town before things got really bad, Big Chief said, taking a bite of food before continuing. We made it to Donnelly, and it was mostly quiet, Big Chief continued. A lot of the people who were sick had been taken by family down to Cascade because it was the closest hospital. When things got past the point of no return, there were only eight of us left in town. A few people wanted to head to Cascade to join their family and the others headed north to find theirs. We thought about staying in Donnelly, but thought it was too much to defend with just the two of us. So we started exploring and found this little slice of heaven, Jody added. Little bit off the beaten path, and a lot easier to defend. Big Chief chimed in. We have more than enough food stashed away to last us through the winter. And come springtime, there's a small farm half a mile up the road with plenty of stuff to plant, Jody continued. Not to mention that the water is just on the other side of Donnelly. Always enjoyed fishing. Now I have an excuse to do it several times a week, Big Chief said. Jody playfully teased him. Oh, please. If you had your way, you'd be out there every day. Come on now. Not every day. Okay. Maybe six days a week, but that's the max. Big Chief admitted, and both of them shared a hearty laugh. Cillian could sense that these two were indeed special together. Despite the world falling apart outside, they were as happy as they could be, riding it out together. They continued to enjoy their meal, sharing stories and savoring each other's company. After dinner, 
Jody retreated to the fire to prepare an apple cobbler, while Big Chief and Cillian moved to the living room, gazing out the window to admire the sunset in silent awe. You have quite the nice little slice of heaven here, Big Chief, Cillian remarked. Yeah, I did all right, all things considered, Big Chief replied. Their conversation was interrupted by Cillian's radio, which blinked a red light to silently alert him to an incoming message. Cillian picked up the device and turned its volume to a low setting. Hello? Is this thing on? Cillian inquired. The voice on the other end belonged to Sergeant Alvarez and was filled with intensity and a touch of anger. It's Alvarez. Where are you? Sergeant Alvarez demanded. Just up the road from Cascade, in Donnelly. Where are you? Cillian replied. Sergeant Alvarez's response was swift. Following your side road directions around Cascade, where are we meeting? I'll meet you just south of Donnelly. There's a big town sign on the right side of the road. Can't miss it, Cillian informed him. We'll be there soon, Sergeant Alvarez concluded, and the line went dead. Cillian turned to Big Chief, who'd been listening. I appreciate you not bringing your friends here. You invited me here, not them, Cillian pointed out. Big Chief nodded in understanding. Just then, Jody returned with a steaming bowl of cobbler. Heard you have to leave soon, so you better eat up. Not quite all the way done, but I didn't think you'd mind, she said. Cillian gladly accepted the offer. No, ma'am, I don't mind at all. As he began to enjoy the delicious dessert, Big Chief playfully nudged Jody, giving her an expectant look. You just heard me say it needs a little while longer, Jody teased him. Big Chief continued to give her a playful look, coaxing her to relent. Okay, fine, a couple of bites, but you're waiting until it's done for the full portion, Jody conceded. Big Chief's face lit up with a grin, and Jody returned to the fire. Together, they savored their dessert before Cillian packed up and headed back to his bike. Big Chief and Jody escorted him to the gate, opening it up. You be safe out there, Cillian, Big Chief advised. I will do my best, Big Chief, Cillian replied. Cillian shook hands with both of them before starting his bike. He rode slowly down the trail, stopping just before he disappeared into the trees. He looked back at the happy couple. You did good, Big Chief. You did good. Cillian whispered to himself before refocusing on his mission. He revved the throttle and headed down the darkened path toward the meeting point. Arriving at the designated spot, he stayed just behind the sign, waiting for the convoy to arrive. After a few minutes, he saw the headlights on the horizon and the lead vehicle pulled to a halt, riddled with bullet holes, including several in the front windshield. Sergeant Alvarez stepped out to greet him. Good God, what happened? Cillian exclaimed. Sergeant Alvarez's voice was heavy with the weight of what they had faced. It's one hell of a story. The End